Thanks, Kevin. Thank you, Nina. Hello, everybody. Welcome aboard for another great AIM webinar, this time with our friends from Zia Consulting, talking about disruptive innovation, how to leverage enterprise data and automation in ways that matter. And why is this important? Well, look, everywhere organizations are retooling their systems and rethinking their ways of working. Customer expectations are changing, technologies are evolving fast, and new tools and techniques are needed in order to remain competitive and relevant. For many, this means adopting a mindset of disruptive innovation, an overarching strategy to transform the business, disrupt the marketplace, and outpace the competition. But disruptive innovation is difficult to do if you struggle with your current systems and approaches to information management. Many of us feel limited in our ability to really innovate in ways that matter. Indeed, nearly 25% of AIM member organizations tell us that digitizing, automating, and integrating data and systems and process is their top barrier to process improvement. Most point to the overwhelming tide of unstructured information and a lack of tactics to, to deal with it as the Achilles heel of innovation. So what steps can you take to more effectively use data and automation to disrupt and innovate? That's the subject of our webinar today. We'll explore best practices to bring structure to unstructured data, how enterprise automation can improve process performance and information agility, ways data and automation combine for superior customer and employee experience, and steps to innovate and build competitive advantage. So get ready for another informative session. But before I introduce our guest today, I do want to say that we want to hear from you too. We'd like to encourage everyone here attending today to participate with your comments and your questions. Indeed, if you have a question along the way, please enter that into the Q&A feature. That's where Nina and I will be watching for questions. I may include some of your questions in the flow of the show today as we go, and we'll have a few minutes at the end for questions as well. So with all of that said, let's bring aboard our guest expert today, Mike Mann. Mike, are you with us? I am. Hi, Kevin. Thank you. Hello, Mike. Let's formally introduce Mike Mann. Mike is the president and CEO of Zia Consulting, a consulting firm that are experts in automating business process through streamlined content management. Mike's a technology solutions entrepreneur with more than 20 years of content management experience in numerous verticals. He's a board member of the Colorado Thought Leaders Forum, a board member of the Titan 100, a premier group of 100 CEOs and C-level executives in business metropolitan areas across the country. And he is with us today to talk about disruptive innovation and how to leverage enterprise data and automation in ways that really matter. So, Mike, welcome aboard. Let's start with this question. What do you mean by disruptive innovation and how does it and can it and should it apply to our industry today? Uh, well, thank you. And I love that question. It's a it's a topic that's near and dear to my heart. I I kind of have three things I talk about when we talk about disruptive um, innovation. So the, the theory was introduced in the 90s by uh, Dr. Clayton Christensen. Um, so there's a process for this. Um, and the, the classic example of, of, of it is, is, you know, to Uber an industry. And I'll talk about why that's not actually disruptive innovation. Um, it's just disruptive, right? It's innovative, uh, but it's not actually following the tenets of disruptive innovation. Dis disruptive innovation really has has like four key tenets to it, and and we use these in as a, as part of our 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 successful methodology that we've used at Zia for over twenty years um, to just roll that into the way that we assess uh, measure against people's outcomes and really dig at the hard at the hard problems that people follow. Um, the first. The first thing to understand about disruptive innovation, the thing that that really is challenging for a lot of business leaders, is it is it's it's a process, right? This is a process change to the way that you think about your business. Um, in classically defined disruptive innovation, uh, focuses on often overlooked uh, market segments that are lower um, lower end or or um, lower cost, not necessarily lower value. Um, and that's where people can kind of put time and energy into that um, so long as it actually 
provides value to their existing customers. Um, the reason I talk about that, so that's the first tenant. The reason I talk about this in the context of established businesses is the, is the theory actually bears out that most people are worried about someone disrupting your business. The truth is only 6% of market entrants actually successfully disrupt, like maintain and last long enough to actually disrupt the market. So while it's real um, that, that there's risk out there, it's, it's, it's pretty small. Um, the second one is this really should be focusing on a new business model. It might be the way that you process something. We'll talk about an example of that. I've got a couple later on in the conversation where we'll talk about how people have, have kind of eased into it uh, um, to solve a problem with the business that actually ends up driving um, a, a new market uh, strategy, a new business process. The other thing too is uh, it doesn't always work and that's not people's favorite thing to hear. Um, but if you fail quickly uh, without a lot of expense, um, it's really not that um, it's really not that big of a deal. And then the last question is: people need to either disrupt or or. Oh, Mike, you became muted there. Mike, there yes. you go. We lost Sorry. you for a second. There we yeah. go. Yep, I, uh, go I slid the wrong way. I slid yeah. the, the wrong <laughs> way on the on the mic. I apologize. Very good. Um, yeah. So um, the the reason uh, that we've taken this approach, and I said there's three things that we talk about. So we talk about disruptive innovation as, as basically a it's a process and a way of thinking. The second thing is, is it's tied to two, two really key industry things that is on everyone's mind right now. The first is hyper automation, which is the entire stack of things from really capturing um, structured and unstructured content um, uh, or data, uh, turning that into structured content. I could talk a little bit about that. And then using that downstream in business processes and because it's aim, because of the business we're in, we're always working with high value data. So we tend to govern that, protect it, store it, retain it for a period of time and make it useful. So that's, that's hyper automation. Z has been doing hyper automation since they uh, cleverly came up with the, with the term uh, Gartner a few years ago. Um, and then the third one is just digital transformation. And there's there's a bunch of examples. And I think that's best used as an example later on. I think, Kevin, you're going to queue me up for that anyway. Well, Mike, let's talk about how to leverage enterprise data and automation in ways that matter, that are transformative. AIM members tell us that one of the biggest barriers to innovation is the overwhelming volume of information today. Much of it is unstructured. What's your advice for tools and techniques to bring structure to this unstructured information? So th that's excellent. You know, I, I'm I'm not gonna I'm not gonna drop um, products as a <laughs> as a tool right now, but I will tell you that there's a combination of of um, commercial products that are available as well as some darn near free open source tools um, or that are provided by some of the large uh, vendors like AWS or Azure um, uh, as well. Um, the thing that's important about that, and, and this is kind of how we describe the value of this. When a human being, it, it, like if you use a inbox routing for um, uh, legal, uh, legal documents associated with like an insurance claim um, or someone going through a malpractice suit, um, or someone being sued. Uh, there's a lot of information that that flows along with that. And it's very hard to discern what's a legal record, what was a bill for the particular um, uh, uh, piece of work that was invoiced versus what you're paying the company for, meaning the, your actual bill that you you owe. Some people bundle all this into a, to a single place. And discerning that is really tough. It takes a human being to look at a packet of information uh, decipher it, route it where it's supposed to go, reroute it if it's done incorrectly. Um, and what we're able to achieve with the tools that we use is the ability to classify basically what is it, um, uh, extract key information from it, what's on it, and then use that information um, with a high level of competence to say, um, you know, if it's, if it's got better, you know, um, if it's got billing information in it, the two information is here. 
and the from information is there, we can discern that that is based on the content and it's in, this is either our bill or our customer's bill. Um, we also run that through some AI tools that actually improve the classification extraction. The reason that we do that is just simply to take the human being out of the analysis. What did I receive and what's on it? Because from that decision point, the answer of where it should go, what, what, we, what sh we should do, that's actually pretty well known. Um, you were right on the, right on the money with the, the uh, difficulty of unstructured content is the Achilles heel. Uh, I think that's actually the quote that came from AIM themselves, which is 70% of participants said that out of thousands surveyed that, that unstructured content like the content in an email or a legal letter um, or a contract disrupts the ability to do end-to-end -end processing and achieve the benefits of full automation. Um, Z has been doing that work on extraction and classification of information uh, for 13 years. So we kind of have our, uh, we have a little bit of a, a, a step ahead of, of normal automation vendors uh, in our ability to handle that content. Um, it's a really long, uh, detailed um, <laughs> answer, uh, but but we'd love to chat with people about if if you want to, uh, follow up with us. We we can give well, you a thirty you're, minute. You're free, right, free Mike. We consistently hear in our surveys and our discussions with AIM members that unstructured content and the volume of it is an inhibitor to uh, innovation. Mm -hmm. You'd mentioned AI. Now, of course, on the minds of everyone these days is the use of AI and automation. It's in the news. It's in the hallways at AIM 23. Many organizations are looking to use these modern techniques robotic process automation, chat GPT, generative AI, all of it, and other uh -huh. tools to automate key processes within the business. And this is where the rubber meets the road in terms of organizational performance. So what are the advantages that you see that are possible now today? And how can we capture the promise uh, of innovation and AI and automation? So I think the first thing to acknowledge, and it, I was uh, I was also at AIM, and I was we had a, a vigorous debate on the leadership council about this with the board members and the rest of the team on the council. The first thing to do with AI is embrace the fear, right? Um, candidly, uh, um, it's going to provide a disruption. Um, we don't know what that is. Uh, similar to, you know, horses. To uh, I think the best analogy that I heard during the leadership council was. The analogy of what happens when autos came in, right? There's still blacksmiths. They were just putting discs on drums for brakes, not shoes on horses, right? So AI isn't going to, AI is going to remove jobs from, from the economy for sure, um, but it's going to create new jobs. And the places where, I'll give you a quick example. If you take a legal document and you run it through a, a standard uh, OCR, optical character recognition uh, piece of software, and try to figure out what it is. It's 50, 30 to 70% accurate, which is a pretty broad range, right? Call it 50% on average. Um, if you tell something like uh, the, the pro version of ChatGPT, this is a legal document, extract these six fields, it does a fantastic job of pulling that information out and submitting it in accurate XML that you could use in a downstream process to feed. It's one of the things that Z is looking at, integrating different AI tools and models to say, I know what this is, it's this, tell me what's on it. And, and it does a great job. That's a, that is something that we have not figured out with technology in the 28 years that I've been doing this work. Um, not at a high enough level that it's predictable. It's like the expense of automating something versus the the managerial overhead of looking at what was automated and is it valuable and all the edge cases, I think that's going to dramatically change our future. One of the things that was most exciting for me as a technologist and, 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 a, and a leader in this industry is to listen to not only AIM's approach, but our customers the same way. They're saying, look, we need to create alignment around AI. We need to create education um, and apply best practices it actually creates a tremendous opportunity for us uh, in the room to, to wisely use um, um, artificial intelligence um, to, to streamline problems that we just haven't been able to solve. Do I think it's going to disrupt every single thing that we do? No, I, I, I really don't. 
I think it's just going to change the nature of how we work. Think of it like Excel or a calculator, maybe a really smart one. Um, it's a part of what we do every single day, and we get to do more. We can do more things with it because those tools exist. So, when it comes to disruptive innovation, which is where we started our conversation yeah. today, really disrupting the market, finding new markets, disrupting the competition, whether I use AI or RPA or just other process automation tools that we're already familiar with, where can these ideas and techniques best be applied and what specific processes lend themselves well to the approach that you're suggesting? So let me give you let me give you an example of how we're using this and so the other thing you got to understand is that almost everybody uh just takes the term <laughs> number one well i think i think you you kind of asked this question a minute ago but i i kind of want to answer it on the front of what i have to say next people say what's the number one barrier um to to going forward with disruptive innovation or a digital transformation initiative or a hyper automation journey, right? And that the truth is, is inaction is is the biggest form of action that we have in in the states right now. In in well, the states in every company uh, uh, that I've worked with in in my twenty eight years. And there's, I mean, compound interest is a is the eighth great wonder of the world, right? According to Albert Einstein, there's a case for inaction. The problem is, is that over time money grows in value but your data does not if you look at a data curve and there's a there's an awesome guy that coined the term data diabetes um where we just have too much of it and its value over time diminishes right so inaction against a large data set means that you're going to get less and less value from that large data set the other thing that's true is um the other thing that's true is that the risk associated with with the vast amount of unknown information and data um, that's out there is is completely nuts. Um, your risk of you know most people have a process where they'll process information that comes in from a customer or a claim or something, um, an application. It doesn't really matter payroll, um, and to get their job done, they have to download that information, store it somewhere, put it back into the system they're working with, keep copies in case someone calls them back. What you've got is you've got you got personal identifying information and business critical information sprinkled throughout your entire system. That's not exactly a clean data set that you can work with uh, for automation. Um, what we want to do is kind of remove those barriers. So, so where do you start with that? The thing that we and tying this back to disruptive innovation, Kevin, I really appreciate the question. Um, we look at it um, a business case that we used with one of our customers. There's kind of three that I'm thinking of. One was nine years ago, one was about six years ago, and one was in the last year or so. Um, and we kind of looked at it the same way, which is where is the manual piece of, of work that's being done? That is, that doesn't scale unless you have to put more people on it. Um, it's not a very good job, right? I mean, if you look at any of the Gallup surveys around employee satisfaction, um, greater than 50% of the people are, are disengaged, actively disengaged or don't care um, about our business. Um, the, the numbers are pretty bad and they, they get worse every year. Part of that's because we just ask people to do horrible work, right? So one of Zia's basic tenets is to make work better, make people's lives better. So how do you do that? You look at a process that's intensely manual. Um, maybe your outsourcing costs are relatively inexpensive to do it, but the only way that you can scale is to just add more people to the system, right? Um, so if you want to double your business, you want a 20% growth in business, you're going to have at least that much manual intervention associated with it. So think of a mailroom, think of an email inbox, and that can be receiving mortgages, legal information, medical records, insurance claims, and it doesn't matter. Um, we would take a look at that as a low-hanging fruit opportunity to prove the value of, of hyper automation and disruption to the business. The way we would look at it is say, look, we want to grab something where there's enough volume that that you're going to able going to be able to take the manual piece of it out. And there's a real example of this with one of our insurance customers. They had 15 people in their claims department that would physically route mail uh, back and forth 
um, to different departments. And the average time to deal with that took about two days. So they'd scan something in, um, hand you know, put it in a cart, hand deliver it. If there was an error, meaning it was delivered to the wrong department, they'd have to come back downstairs and take another day or two to go. So turnaround time, two to four days to get mail right. um, to someone to process a claim. What we were able to do is take a look at that and say, we think we can identify what, what claims those are, whether that's legal correspondent claims, payroll billing, HR, et cetera, all come through the mailroom or through an inbox and quickly, without even classify or extracting information, send that information off to different departments and cut the processing time down from two days down to about 30 seconds, minute, minute and a half. Each of the people that were in that team Three people stayed on as managers. The other 12 moved to um, the data um, analytics department because they'd been looking at that content for 30 years and they started doing data scrubbing, data analysis and reworking. So people didn't lose their job. They did higher value work. Um, the financial turnarounds for the company were tremendous. The reason I bring that up as a disruptive innovation um, piece, Kevin, is that it addresses several things. One, fear in the market and the industry around this is going to replace my job. Um, we just created better jobs for these folks. Two, people were, were moved up into managerial um, um, positions and the company is returning like $150,000 a month uh, on return from like an initial 300K investment. Um, that's disruptive and in, in it changed the way they do business. They didn't have to scale. Um, they actually acquired some other businesses and didn't didn't have to double the size of their mailroom or their inbox automation team. Um, and we're seeing those kind of benefits work. You do one or two of those, and it creates what we call a culture of winning. Kind of changes the fundamental respect that IT has uh, in relationship to the business. And all of a sudden, people and executives move in and say, "Gosh, if we gave you 300k and you turn 150k around a month, um, and you're taking." risk out of the system, storing things correctly, making our customers happier because we get, you know, we pay claims faster or, or respond quicker. Um, these are just win, win, win. What other things should we be looking at? And that's the process of lower end, kind of not as highly valuable as your, as your top five, you know, top 10 key priorities for a business that are focused directly on customers. You're just really disrupting your own business processes. Um, but the wins are significant and it actually it creates the basis to fundamentally change your your overall it structure your technology stack so, long answer yeah. sorry <laughs> we are here today with mike mann president and ceo of zia consulting they're experts at automating business processes through streamlined content management you can find him and find out more at ziaconsulting.com we're here talking about disruptive innovation and how to leverage enterprise data and automation if you have a question for Mike, please feel free to enter it into the Q&A feature. We will be working to get to some of your questions here in just a moment. But Mike, when it comes to innovation, one thing that AIM members tell us consistently is that, that they often struggle to get a seat at the C-suite table and get the buy-in and the resources and money that they need to really innovate. What's your advice for our audience members today who may be struggling to manage the change and get the executive sponsorship that they need. Is there a process or a model we can follow? That is a great question. Look, the, the basis for this is, you know, I, I talked about Dr. Christensen's uh, disruptive innovation model. The model kind of that's set out is most, most major players in business that want to look at disruptive technologies for their own company, focus on what their customers need and they ignore disruptors, right? And so your inability to, to think differently um, is an impediment. Um, I, I challenge that theory a little bit um, specifically this way with, with, with an outcome-driven approach. Um, so I'll tell you how we solve it and, and how we arm people with it. It's like, look, you know, we have... So, so if it's true that most businesses are going to focus on their top accounts and that's where the money market and focus and attention should be, every single one of them are dealing with legacy systems where customers are not that, you know, the thing that we can improve upon is customer experience. And by customer, I mean external, your actual customers, 
your business partners, your B2B partners, and your internal employees. That is the area that every single business is struggling right now. I don't care what sector you're in, um, the, whether it was the great resignation or quiet quitting or people just moving out of the, out of the industry or high turnover um, or people now having to shift some of those jobs overseas because we paid too much money uh, because of that market demand. These are real things that our, our businesses are dealing with. Um, the approach that we take is we say, look, we would like to have you take a look at an initial an initial pilot or two or three. Um, and we kind of use pilot to production um, as, as a methodology. We're going to focus on one simple thing where the, the, where the return is expected within six to nine months. The financial return is expected within six to nine months. Um, almost everybody can get around the conversation of saying, I have 30% or 60% turnover in my, um, in my part of the organization. So maybe customer experience or maybe uh, feedback on applications or maybe just routing the, the information correctly to different aspects of the business. That is frequently overlooked. If you improved your response time to your customers, stop the churn, um, which just crushes HR departments and, 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 and businesses' ability to scale. Um, you could say, look, we've, we've talked to this firm, Zia. They think they've got some ideas on how we can automate some of our manual processes and get quick returns. That would demonstrate how we would use this as a backbone of trust, uh, trust being a big one to start moving up the chain. We're going to focus on getting rid of legacy processes, automating the, the security and governance of information and making sure people have it quickly. That'll return turnaround response times rapidly. So it's kind of a five-fold uh, benefit. Customers get a, a better experience working quickly uh, with, with people uh, and information, um, like a claim response or, you know, um, or letting someone know that their mortgage application wasn't complete. Uh, people stop their churn in their organizations. People are upskilled in, into new technology um, and to new business processes. And there's the financial gain that ties directly to a business strategy, right? Mm -hmm. So um, the thing that's missing the most in the conversation when people are fighting for something that's a good idea is they forget to tie it to one of the core problems the business is facing, like customer experience, H, you know, employee turnover, churn, um, you know, risk, right? Real. So tie your request to the business strategy and then bring that back down to a financial return where, where, where you're benefiting everybody with that new tech. Well, I think you make a great point, Mike. One of the biggest failure factors in my research anyway is, is this disconnect between digital transformation efforts and the key performance indicators of the organization, which really surprised me. I mean, if you go out and look, you'll see some of the major analyst firms uh, providing some really surprising stats on this gap. And I think yeah. one of the reasons why this exists is that there is a difficulty not only tying the two together, uh, understanding perhaps what the key performance indicators, first of all, are in an organization and how our efforts do link to those, but then really mm -hmm. providing measurements that make a real difference and paint a real picture there. Do you have any advice on key areas that we should be measuring and building into our strategies in terms of measurement re results measurements, how they can be applied and to help us get the sponsorship and indeed the results that we're looking for? Yeah, it's, it's still the, you know, every business is different. So those, those, those KPIs are going to be different specifically, but let, let me give you an example. Um, I, I won't name the customer because I, I don't have permission to do that. Um, but we have the dream team um, at a customer, right? So they've had some technology failures in the past. Um, they've got new leadership. They expect um, streamlining processes, higher margins, more customers, differentiation in the market, right? <laughs> okay, that's great. But they're, you know, it's, a, it's an old business, meaning it's really well established with a really great customer base. Um, how do you do that, right? That's really, really tough. So going in is my probably my least favorite thing um, and kind of our second way that we solve this problem is where people come in and say, look, we're going to migrate you off that, put you on a new stack and change everything. We're going to we're going to rewrite a 50 year old business right in it in in six months or a year. I mean, it's any smart business owner, uh, CIO, COO, CEO is going to just 
call shenanigans on that. It's just not going to be a thing that they believe. Um, unfortunately, some people go after that or they get they get hooked on somebody saying they're an AI firm. Well, what does an AI firm mean? They probably mean they're, they, they, they've kind of duct taped some things together, duct tape and bailing wire, just enough AI and machine learning to say that their old technology and process is going to work. We're a bit more pragmatic about that. We kind of look at something and say, look, where's your most pain? Where can you have the significant claim, you know, or gain um, from, from fixing that? And, and, and how would we address it? And then we do a process that we call diagnostic, which is we look to, should we retire this? Can we replace it? Do we, do we rehost it, kind of lift and shift it? Do we wrap around it and just improve it by creating like an API? Or are there elements of it that we would redo? So how that actually plays out um, in, in, in the world of a kind of advice and how we would help strategize that and, and tie that back to an initiative. If you say, look, we need to stop churn at like we've got a, a high degree of turnover in our intake department because it's just kind of a yucky job, to be honest. Um, we have a lot of errors that go back through that cost us a ton of money. And our customers are consistently frustrated by the amount of time it takes for us to respond to that. Mm -hmm. That is an area that we would look at immediately and say, we can solve those three problems by removing the manual uh, inspection of, of, of what comes into the business and route it appropriately and stop there. Just getting that first win, most people, Kevin, chew off too much. They just chew off too much. They're like, I'm going to do this entire end-to-end -end thing. And trust me, as a CEO of a, of, a, of a company that sells this work, I would love for every customer to come in, drop loads of cash, and give me a three-year run. Um, but we don't mind earning it, right? So we would look and say, we, we can reduce, you know, in this one example, we went from 16 minutes for manual intervention down to one minute. That's a pretty remarkable return. Our, our hit rate on accuracy was in the 90s. Um, and... And we haven't done anything downstream with it yet, right? They're just getting a financial return, proved out that we can do something in 90 days. Speed is the other piece of this that really matters, Kevin, is you have to deliver quickly because you've got to be able to build trust, get people on board, get feedback and show that it works. Um, projects that go six months, 18 months, outlive budget cycles, sometimes ownership, sometimes leadership changes. Uh, and you need All to right. prove your, your success every time. We are here today with Mike Mann from Zia Consulting. We're talking about disruptive innovation, how to leverage enterprise data and automation. Mike, we're almost out of time, but I do want to leave some time for some questions that are coming in from our audience. And if you have a question for Mike, please feel free to enter that into the Q&A feature now, and we'll see if we can get it into uh, the Q&A feature here shortly. Um, now, Mike, uh, one last question. How does Zia help with all of this? What are some next steps and resources that you can suggest? Oh, that's great. So one of the things that we're offering for, um, you know, as being a, a partner with um, with AIM and on the AIM Leadership Council, um, we've decided to offer kind of a what we call a hyper automation health check. And so we're going to use the processes that I talked about today to, to kind of look at what we what we can dis disrupt in the, in the way that you do business today. Um, we've got a, a call to action page. It's not we're not going to spam you from this. Just go to zaconsulting.com, uh, go to AIM a DI, and that's AIM, the organization, A I I M D I, uh, for disruptive innovation. And we're going to do a 30 minute um, health check. Just if someone came in and said, These are my key business initiatives, this is our pain points, these are our problems, we would come back with a recommended approach on how to chat with, with, um, with people uh, to uh, either. How would you budget that? How would you take that up to management? Um, how would you propose it? Um, or, or maybe a deeper knife, uh, a dive would be needed. Um, we've also got several assets around disruptive innovation and hyper automation that we would be able to share with people that they could have as lead behind assets. Very for that good. Conversation too. Thank you. All right, Mike, we do have some questions coming in for our audience. So I do wanna to get to some of them as many as we can today. I'll try to get to as many as we can here in the time that we have left. Um, we have one coming in from John. John, thank you for your question today. John says, I've heard words, sentences, and documents referred to as a vector. 
I know what vectors are. Can you explain how that vector is calculated? <laughs> I'm not quite sure what you're talking about, buddy. Uh, words, sentences, and documents described as a vector. Um, I think you're talking about something really specific, uh, either to an article or something that you've read. Um, we don't really talk about that in terms of vectors because that creates uh, confusion. For us, we would call that intake, right? So um, when you look at it, when, when I talk to people in our business or our, that are not in my industry about what we do, I would say, look, we take in, an organization takes in information every day, data from machines, um, documents, emails, letters, um, chat transcripts, social feeds, uh, all the way through um, everything else. The, that process has to go through something to say, what is it, what's on it, and where does it go? And if the answer is it's important, regulated, protected, governed, or is critical to the business, it needs to be routed, uh, stored, protected, and made useful. So I think when you're talking about vector, you're talking about an intake vector um, that would be associated with an ingestion point. Um, again, those streams on the outside of kind of the intake wheel, AIM's got a really complex diagram that describes it. It's very, very thorough. Um, it would just be one of those input vectors from, from different sources. Um, but again, we try to keep language uh, more like someone that's using content or documents. Um, we try to keep that as common language. All right. Not sure if that good. answered the question. But. All right. Very good. And this one coming from Mary. Mary, thank you. Um, what would you say are three major com components for management to buy into digital transformation? What are those? What would awesome. you say would be the three major buckets that we should be really looking at, Mike? I love that. First one, don't talk about information management, information governance. That's what we talk about at AIM and the people on the call probably really care about. Do not talk about that. People roll their eyes. They don't want to hear about it. They don't want to pay for it. So that's the first bucket not to talk about. The first bucket to talk about is customer experience, employee experience, and your financial impact to the business by streamlining. If the, you know, that's, that's the, the three things that every single organization from my research, our analyst research, my unbelievable uh, marketing team's research who comes from academia, what we found is customers need to solve the, the employee turnover problem and improve, improve workers' experience, right? Your goal as, a, as an employer should not be one of the companies on the Gallup poll where, where over 50% of your people hate their work, are actively disengaged, or just don't care enough, right? So you, you got to make work relevant. If you fix that problem, everything gets better, right? As your people go, so goes your success. Two, get in front of your customers and respond to them quickly. This is what we can offer by doing automation and hyper automation. And then the last one is anytime you're taking excess waste, um, bad jobs, errors out of the process, you're saving money. Um, and most businesses uh, around the world still still run on, on profit. So those are the three things you really have to focus on. Um, and that's what we will force you into if you're gonna work with us, because um, it's the way we think. All right, another question coming in. How might you recommend getting stakeholder buy-in for improving internal processes that might not necessarily result in direct profit increase? Um, well, kind of not, not to hammer my point over and over again. If you are looking at something where you can carve off a, 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 new, a new market or a new industry um, and, and reach a whole bunch of new customers, that's interesting. An internal process that doesn't drive um, financial results, had better satisfy people, had better create better jobs, <laughs> right? Like you have to solve customer experience or you have to solve employee experience, in, in my opinion. Um, the last three years from, from COVID, working from home has really shown people the, the terrible ways that we, that we have rolled out to communicate with each other. Uh, with remote workers, workers in different parts of the world, um, we've just created a lot of risk and a lot of broken processes. So driving better experience, happier employees, faster results, um, all of those will have a financial bottom. 
um, bottom line. My challenge to you is if you're looking at an internal process that would make a difference in your employee or your customer experience, it probably has a financial impact. Um, I mentioned the dream team at our customer. The COO is on board. The CIO is on board. And lastly, the, um, the operational, kind of the production managers and the people that actually run the functioning of the business. We're talking to all three components that drive metrics, finances, technological success, and streamlined processes. Um, if you could get that level of buy-in, um, man, you are, you're crushing it. And we'd love to help with the conversation. We're pretty good at it. Well, Mike, we're almost out of time, but before I let you go, one last question. You mentioned COVID. Mm -hmm. It was only three years ago. It seems like forever. <laughs> when it does. It recently does. the country was shut down. Um, five years ago, we would never have predicted COVID or the disruption that it prompted in business and in technology and many of the things that we've lived through over the last five years, we could have never predicted. So I will ask you to predict our next five years. What should we all be thinking about now and strategizing for today in order to be prepared for the next five years? That's a, that's an awesome question. So um, I think number one, major trauma, uh, like global trauma happens about every seven to 10 years. So to think that we're not going to have a financial crisis or something unforeseen, uh, you know, a war, um, another, you know, heaven forbid, a, another virus, um, to, we're going to have something like that happen. And what we've seen with COVID is a dramatic shift towards technology and breaking old paradigms of work. I think that shift is going to happen aggressively. Um, because of the influx of AI. And if you add financial or global disruption, that is a mul that's a force multiplier for the impact of, of AI. Um, what I would say is start getting your hands uh, dirty. Um, take a course. Um, push AIM to develop courses. Uh, please do that. Uh, on AI and embrace the standards that we have and care about as an AIM society. Uh, tackling business problems uh, for leaders. I think that change is going to drive uh, dramatic new uh, job growth. Um, we're going to have to get past the fear of it. That's what that's what big disruptions do is they push people out of their comfort zone and force them to make choices. Um, that's kind of what happened with 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 the whole global work from home thing. Is people overnight became a work from home place. Right? It was on their five year roadmap. So I think we're going to see that integration of artificial intelligence put in. I hope that comes with regulations and best practices and a little bit of common sense. Um, but move away from the fear of it, start embracing it, and, uh, and look how you can gain uh, benefits in your, own, in your own job or your own business. That's what we're doing at Zia, and I would challenge people to do the same. I think that's where we're headed pretty quickly. That is Mike Mann, President and CEO of Zia Consulting. You can find Mike and find out more at ziaconsulting.com. Mike, thank you so much for being our guest today. At this point, I think I'm going to turn it back over to Nina. Nina, you have some news for us about the new AIM 23 Industry Watch Report. Absolutely, Kevin. AIM's 2023 Industry Watch Report is live in this 2023 State of the Intelligent Information Management Industry Report, we use user-generated intelligence to uncover the realities of post-pandemic information management and its impact on current industry and economic forces. The key findings in the report point to a number of opportunities for next generation success and several roadblocks to getting there. So don't get left behind. Download your copy today for the latest independent findings and three essential recommendations from AIM. As we bring this webinar to a close, a few last minute reminders. We've recorded this webinar so you can catch anything you wanna hear again in a recap email that will be sent within 24 hours. A link to the resources for this webinar was put in the chat. You'll find a copy of Mike's contact slide, as well as additional resources through that link. 
Don't forget to take our feedback survey and let us know how we did. A big thank you to our sponsor, Zia Consulting, with, for a wonderful, informative webinar. Without them, we would not be able to give you free educational material. And before we wrap up, I'd like to ask Mike if he has any last minute key takeaways for our audience. Um, just one thing, and this is something I tell my kids and my employees, uh, go be the chief learning officer of your life, right? Really embrace the education that AIM offers. Listen to wonderful podcasts like, like Kevin puts out, devour books. Um, the best way through all the things that we have coming at us in the future uh, is through learning. So go there. Thank you very much. Absolutely. And what about you, Kevin? Well, this has been another great AIM webinar. Look, things are changing fast. Customer expectations are changing. Technologies, of course, are changing. And the, the, the demands and requirements of our industry are changing as well. So these types of discussions about disruptive innovation and how to use data and automation in ways that matter, I think are super important. So I want to thank Mike and thank everyone for coming here today for to be a part of the discussion today. Absolutely. Thanks again, everyone, for joining us today. This is Nina from AIM saying see you next time. Take care, Bye, everyone. Everybody.